Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for tuning in tonight. We're at the Jefferson Society, and I want to thank the president of the Jefferson Society, Ferki Ferrati, for welcoming us and enabling us to put on this program for Erie and for the people in Pennsylvania. I also want to express my appreciation to the Pennsylvania Cable Network that is taping this and is covering this for us tonight. Our goal tonight is really very simple. We have with us uh, three psychiatrists from the LECOM Behavioral School of Behavioral Health. Our program is really very simple. They will introduce themselves, give a little bit of a reflection upon the state of affairs relative to the disease, and then we will open the floor to questions. Our purpose, though, tonight is really not to talk so much about the science of the disease, but rather it's how we feel about it. How do we handle the anxiety that surely must be with us, how do we handle the kids who are clearly cooped up and uncomfortable being home? How do we handle, how do we feel about being home and how do we handle that? And our hope is that I know these three good colleagues of mine will give you information that is clearly useful and helpful to you. So let us begin first by myself turning the program over to Dr. Megan McCarthy who runs the program. She will begin it, introduce her colleagues and her colleagues and her will answer all of your questions. Again, thank you. Thank you so much, Monsignor Rubino. As Monsignor Rubino mentioned, my name is Dr. Megan McCarthy. I am the residency program director in psychiatry. I also work on the inpatient unit at Mill Creek Community Hospital as a psychiatrist and work in our outpatient setting. And I'm so grateful tonight to be here with two of my colleagues, Dr. Sinha and Dr. Martone. Um, I couldn't do this job without them. It's really wonderful to be part of a program with such supportive colleagues who also really care about this community. And we are so grateful to be here with you tonight to talk about COVID-19 and your mental health. First, we want you to know that you are not alone. As fellow humans across the globe, we are in this together, and we are all impacted by this pandemic. So many people have told me, whether they are my colleagues or my friends, my family and patients, how anxious they are. How anxious they are to come in contact with this virus, and that they will themselves become sick, or that even worse, they, they will infect their loved ones or that their loved ones will become sick. So you are not alone if you are feeling anxious. Many healthcare workers are feeling exhausted. They are working often without the equipment that they need. They are working without masks and gloves that they need at times. And they are fearing for themselves. Will they be able to continue to take care of people as the numbers rise? Many feel sad. Sad that they are missing the freedoms that existed before the fear of COVID-19. I had joked the other day that I missed my life before COVID-19, and I really do. I miss the freedoms that I had before. I miss going to the gym, and so many people are telling me they're missing their families. Um, they're missing holiday gatherings and social gatherings. They're missing hugging one another. They're missing seeing their doctor face to face. They're missing running to the store for something really fast, and they're missing getting in their car or going on an airplane to travel. Many wonder when these restrictions will end. A lot of people feel afraid. How long is this going to go on? How long will the kids be out of school? How long will people be without work? Many are feeling anxious financially. What will happen to the economy? So there's a large spectrum of emotions that people are experiencing right now. But I would say that the word I would use is a general sense of unease. And sometimes it's hard to describe what that unease is. And I wanted to talk to you briefly tonight before we take your questions about what is a typical response to something like this, to a pandemic? Um, and when should maybe you reach out for help and look for some additional support? What most people are experiencing, I would identify as grief. And grief is defined as a deep and poignant distress. And I think that fits so much. So many people are deeply distressed right now. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross defined grief in five stages. The first is denial. And how many of us haven't experienced some sort of denial, have said, this is not going to happen to me. This is not going to happen to my family. This is not going to happen in my community. This is something that's happening far, far away. 
This is something that's happening in China, it's happening in Italy, but it's not going to happen here. Um, and, and denial isn't, isn't all bad. When you go into a bit of a shock, it can be protective. Denial helps people to survive. Um, it only allows you to take in as much as you can handle in the moment. Another stage of grief is anger. A lot of people are feeling angry. Why is this happening? Why now? Why when my son is about to graduate from high school and I'm going to miss him walk across the stage? Why is this happening? Um, and sometimes during this stage of grief, regrets uh, can kick in. People feel like, well, what if I would have done something differently? What if I would have um, understood this better or protected myself better? Could there be something I could have done differently? My advice to you about anger is to really be willing to feel this anger. This is a really important part of emotions when there's a huge stressor like this. We as human beings seem to be better at suppressing this than actually working through this anger. And I encourage you, if you're feeling angry, to allow that to happen. That's part of the process. Bargaining is the third stage of grief. Um, you know, we make all kinds of deals to not experience the, the pain or the loss. And this is very common in grief. Depression is the fourth stage where people feel empty. And this isn't a clinical depression or a, a depression that necessarily needs medication um, or hospitalization, but a, a really, really deep sadness um, in relationship to the loss that we're experiencing right now. You know, I would say if you're not experiencing some degree of sadness, that that would be more, more unusual right now. And the final stage of grief is acceptance. You know, getting to a place where you can accept a new reality. Um, and we will need to re redefine a new, a new set of normals. During acceptance, we can learn to listen to our own needs more. We evolve during this stage, and we can begin to live and enjoy our lives again. I think if you are in any of these stages of grief, you can, be, you can rest assured that, that this is normal, that this is something that most people are experiencing right now. And my hope for you, my hope for all of us, is that we'll be able to, as we process through our grief, be able to experience some meaning as well. Sometimes um, in tragedy, it gives us a new understanding of ourselves and a new understanding of so when should you seek professional supports? Um, and I would advise you, if you are no longer able to take care of yourself, if you are not eating, if you're not sleeping, um, if you're not able to participate in meaningful activity, if you're feeling hopeless or helpless, if you're having any unsafe feelings, feelings that you don't want to live anymore, or you're feeling suicidal, if you are self-medicating, if you're using drugs and alcohol and it's interfering with your life and interfering with your relationships, you should reach out for help. If you're feeling very disconnected or apathetic, um, or if you're worrying to the point where you cannot um, function in your day-to-day -day life, these, these are the times you should reach out for help. Up on our screen here, we have a couple of places where you can reach out for help. We have our outpatient number if you're looking for a resource this outpatient facility is open five days a week, and there are staff there who can answer questions. If you're not sure if you should see a therapist or see a psychiatrist, or you're not sure what to do, you can call and get some support there around what your next step should be. We also have an emergency room through Mill Creek Community Hospital um, that is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week with a psychiatrist. And if you're feeling unsafe in any way, I would encourage you to go to the emergency room. Now keep in mind, other people who are feeling sick are also going to the emergency room. So think through whether or not you would wanna make a phone call or if you, if you really need to show up in person. Um, we are gonna have lots of time to talk about what to do with your emotions. And I'm looking forward to answering your questions um, and exploring those in more detail. Um, my colleagues, Dr. Sinha and Dr. Martone, are going to talk some about their experience with COVID-19 and mental health, and I'm going to turn it over next to Dr. Sinha. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Um, so I was going to touch on how um, this has really impacted children and um, those that are unemployed as far as adults. Um, basically, I mean, I know a lot of us are very hyper-focused on the health aspect of 
how coronavirus is impacting us all. Um, and with social distancing, kind of staying away and avoiding getting sick. I think something else that we need to kind of focus on is how is it emotionally impacting us? Um, and I think, you know, day to day as I treat kids, this is something that comes up constantly. Um, and then it's really been the parents and the caregivers and most of them who have lost their jobs, um, that kind of concern has come second for me for whatever reason. Um, for example, I have this one uh, young gentleman, um, you know, we had a session and his mother, unfortunately, who was in a quote unquote non-essential job um, in like the service industry, lost her job. And, you know, one thing that she just kind of set, expressed to me, she's like, this just came out of nowhere. It was just without any sort of preparation. Um, and I think that's just a really big key that the anxiety just hits because no one really prepared for any of this. Um, with COVID-19, I mean, I really think it's reshaping people's personal lives, work lives, family dynamics, finances, um, and it's really taking a really big toll on kids and adults. For kids, I mean, with schools being out, and daycare centers for young um, infants and toddlers being closed, they're quarantined in the home, rightfully so, to kind of prevent uh, further spread of this disease and virus. But, you know, something that kids kind of always express to me is, we just don't know what to do with our time. And a lot of times parents also kind of express that, that, you know, kids are there as far as at, in school getting the structure um, and kids thrive on structure, the structure, the guidance and without any sort of traditional schooling, there a lot of them are just playing video games and kind of regressing in many ways. Um, you know, what I like to tell parents and kids is try to keep that routine and that structure because you know, they kind of do end up regressing. And when I say regressing, what do I mean by that? Um, for a lot of young adolescents, they kind of regress in behaviors. Um, sometimes you'll see bedwetting and toileting issues and just, you know, a lot of laziness. And I think it's important that we kind of get them back to as close as normal sort of lifestyle as possible um, to kind of avoid having situations like that. In children, I think it's important to look out for certain warning signs. Um, you know, isolation and withdrawal is a big one um, that they just don't know what's going on. And anxiety, as Dr. McCarthy touched on, is, is huge in this population um, and adults. But a lot of times kids just don't want to worry their caregivers, their parents, and don't really know what the appropriate questions are as far as what's going on currently, what's going to be happening. Um, so a lot of times, you know, looking out for that irritability, that withdrawal, um, like I had mentioned, regression of behaviors, um, sleep issues are a big one. If they're not sleeping, they're not eating, all things to kind of look out for. Um, you know, and I think if, if there it comes to a point that you really can't control it on your own, I really think that you should kind of consider taking them for um, help, whether it's at for telehealth at our agency or countless other agencies that are managing services through telehealth. Um, I think also kind of touching on the routine and structure, um, it's important to kind of keep them distracted in ways of creativity, um, you know, kind of playing outside within safe uh, measures um, in a way that really kind of gets their mind occupied that doesn't like really focus on this. And another big thing to not really always keep the news on all the time. While the news is very helpful and is giving us great st statistics on how the disease is progressing, I think that causes more fear in children. Um, and I think it's important to kind of, in a, in a way that they do understand without using sort of big words and negative words, showing them that, you know, there is strength, hope, and positivity in all of this that we will some, some way do will come out of it. And I think giving them that hope is, is really key. Um, you know, on the other aspect of it all are the caregivers, the parents. So adults, let's say, and even if they're not parents, um, you know, a lot of these people, there's about 47 million people who have kind of lost their jobs so far. And these are, like I had mentioned, quote unquote, non-essential um, jobs that are at high risk. So service industry, food, beverage, um, and a lot of these companies have closed. 
I mean, yes, we understand why um, it prevents that spread of the virus, um, and most of these people who have lost their job understand that. Um, but I think the the reality is is that they don't know what the outcome's gonna be. That uncertainty is huge, and these are a lot of people who kind of live paycheck to paycheck um, and don't know when money is gonna be coming in sight, so it causes fear and anxiety that kind of does impact the children because um, they do sense sense all that sort of doubt and fear. Um, but I think something to kind of keep in mind uh, for adults that have lost their jobs is, you know, if you need the help, if you need, you know, some additional help, obviously a lot of people are kind of connecting further um, as far as texting, uh, social media, and things like that. But if you do need the help and something that you feel like you can't do alone, always kind of reach out to seek a professional. Um, but yeah, it, it really is a concerning time, but I think there is a lot of positivity and hope that can come our way. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. John Pierre Martone. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, part of the ECOM health system. I've been in a part of the Erie community for the last 10 years. I would like to start by offering our condolences and prayers to anyone that's been affected by COVID-19. Uh, we are with you and you're not alone. When asked to be part of this panel, I requested to touch on the proverbial silver linings of this pandemic. With the barrage of scary statistics and inconsistent media reports, it's easy to become overwhelmed, anxious, scared, and even fearful. And we respect that and understand that. However, I encourage us all to be a little bit more mindful to take a second and process the here and now, the things we can control, the silver linings. For example, most of you are probably at home, surrounded by your family and loved ones, or at a minimum, know with certainty the whereabouts of your child. Maybe you were able to eat dinner as a family before this event. That in itself should be worth a smile and a pause, a moment of appreciation. Maybe you and your loved ones cooked the meal together. Maybe you have plans to watch a show after this. Again, let's remember to embrace the, the here and now, I would like to believe that social distancing can be looked at as family togetherness. Prior to this pandemic, parents often confided in us that they rarely had family dinners anymore because everyone is so quote unquote busy. Obligations like work, school, sports, extracurricular activities, and peers took precedence over our time and our hierarchy of needs. However, I don't think this is a problem for most anymore. In fact, I would like to believe that this family time is becoming the new normal. This temporary reprieve from our prior lives has given us opportunities to reflect on the things that matter most. Some of the things we thought mattered so much are becoming, are questioned and are even inconsequential. Personally, I am hopeful and pleasantly surprised with the change that this pandemic has brought in regards to family dynamics and individual growth. For the most part, my telemedicine appointments have been filled with comments like, well, he's actually talking with us, or she came down to dinner last night, where I've never spent so much time with my child before. Again, let's pause, process, and appreciate these moments, these changes. Parents and children are sharing that they are spending more time cooking, playing board games, walking outdoors, and doing things as a family. Likewise, it is allowing people to reflect on things that truly matter the most. From a personal standpoint, I have never seen so many children in my subdivision. I didn't even know they existed, to be honest with you. The streets are filled with colored, colorful chalk drawings, Windows are adorned with rainbows offering inspirational messages. There are teddy bears and stuffed animals in almost every window of the homes in my subdivision. Local restaurants and establishments have gone above and beyond and have sent food and refreshments to our hospital. So even when things are gloomy and disparaging, we, as a community, are finding the light, the silver linings. I encourage us all to remember these moments and make sure they stick with us when things go back to quote unquote normal. I can assure you this too will pass. But it's important that we do not let this uncertainty and confusion consume our mental health. Let's live in the here and now and limit the time focusing on the things we have no control over. The gyms, malls, schools, offices, hair salons, trampoline parks and area will all open again. But until then, let's enjoy the stolen moment, the break from our old normal. An interesting quote was shared on a support page that the behavioral team, health team at the hospital created. I'd like to share it. It reads, I think that once the dust settles, we will realize how little we need, how very much we actually have, and the true value of human connection. Thanks. Thank you. Um, for those of you watching, uh, I'm Fergie Ferrari. I am the president of Jefferson. I'm going to conduct uh, 
uh, get some of your questions uh, to the panelists here. So if you are on Facebook and you have a question, uh, go ahead and ask that question and I will read it. Uh, we will start with some questions that we uh, saw uh, before the program begin. So I'll start with how, uh, what are some of the tools I can use to cope with how I'm feeling right now and uh, through this um, uncertain time? I think we can probably all offer some words to that. Um, and I think Dr. Martone touched on this a little bit. Um, coping is a lot about deciding what it is is in your control and what it is is not in your control. Um, and, I, and I think that can be really, really helpful in managing these intense emotions that can come. Um, because so much of this is really out of our control. Um, we don't know when this is going to end and we don't know when we're going to get back into a different kind of routine. We don't know. Um, but the things we can control are how we follow the recommendations. Um, and social, socially distancing properly can be very comforting, knowing that I'm doing the absolute best I can do for myself and my family, for my colleagues, um, for this community can be really comforting. Um, that, that can help people to cope if they know that, you know, my job right now is to make sure that I am not infecting somebody else. And so even though I'm young and I'm healthy and I'm not likely to get um, sick and die from this illness, I am going to do my very best to stay indoors and to help my, my, my fellow human beings um, by, by staying away from them right now. Um, and, and I think that can really help people to cope as well. I think that while we are distancing, we also find ourselves needing to connect. So staying in contact, staying connected with our loved ones um, and with our friends is really important as well. So having relationships, even if it, does, it means that you're sitting six feet apart from them, um, is still really important in coping. Um, and I'm sure that Dr. Sinha and Dr. Martone might have some different responses to this. Yeah, I think for children, it's interesting because like I touched on, um, they wanna have that sense of like normalcy and like understand that things are okay. Um, so I think it's like self-control for them is huge, so kind of, getting them to wash their hands and having them be a part of this quote unquote social distancing and in this quarantine sort of state allows them to feel that, hey, I am doing something to help prevent the spread of this um, virus. And you know, to kind of continue on what Dr. McCarthy was saying, um, something that patients have like even kind of shared with me there when I am like okay so how are you you know killing time um, during this quarantine they're like honestly like I picked up on so many different hobbies to really just keep my mind distracted and it's it put us puts a smile on your face to really hear that like people are now going into art and and you know topsoil and plants and things like that so it's, it's great to hear that I think a different perspective would be the physical aspect of mental health and being physical. You know, the social distancing does require us to be a distance apart, but it doesn't mean we can't be outdoors and go for walks and do things as a family and spend time exercising in a healthy manner. There's a lot of online resources like online yoga classes, Pilates classes. I think it's very important that during this quarantine, we just don't resort to sitting on our phones or engaging in video games for nine, 10 hours a day like some of the kids have been confiding in us and I think it's important that we try to get back to a normalcy and get exercise back in our daily routine because there's such a strong relationship between mind and body. Okay, uh, let's stay with the kids. This person wants to know, how do I talk to my kids about the coronavirus? I think it's important to reassure them um, and kind of address the issue rather than tiptoeing around the issue. Um, kids, kids are very aware of what's going on. Um, so I think kind of negating what they're saying and minimizing their feelings wouldn't be appropriate. I think addressing it in a way that they can understand uh, in, and like I had touched on without using such negative dooming words is key. Um, reassuring them, um, you know, kind of focusing on the positives like Dr. Martone had touched on so, so much good has kind of come out of this, but I think really showing them that, hey, yes, there is this pandemic going on and, and a lot of people are getting sick, but 
to focus on a lot of the positive aspects of it all and how they are helping um, not for, you know, spread this virus is, is key, but really sitting down with them and kind of reassuring them that things will be okay. Yeah, I think kids are also looking to you as a role model. So as a parent, if you're staying calm um, and if you're being honest with yourself about how you feel and honest with them, I think that goes a long way too. Kids are really, really smart and they're like sponges. They will pick up on your emotions and talking to them honestly about your experience and also asking them what they've, what they've heard, I think can be really useful as well. It might give you information as to where their mind is and, and where they're looking for reassurance or guidance. They might have a completely different perspective than you might have anticipated. And then also to go along with being a role model, I think it's important for parents, caregivers to you know, take breaks, to get the appropriate amount of sleep, to eat, to show kids that you know, I'm also taking care of myself, therefore you should as well. Um, kind of you know, what we touched on, really seeking the help, um, because kids really look up to caregivers as like, okay, if they're doing okay, then maybe things aren't as bad as I'm making it out to be. Okay, we have a question here from Facebook. Is there support for nurses, respiratory therapists, and others uh, that provide the patient care? And the person has a second question as well. Also, will there be, uh, will the nurses be able to have the time to be with patients while they are dying alone? Gosh, those are such great questions and hard questions. Um, <laughs> I think that the whole first line responder team, um, especially nurses and respiratory therapists, are experiencing some trauma. And um, I would encourage that anybody who is experiencing this traumatically to reach out for help. Um, I think that we would want a nurse, just like anybody else, to call and to ask for advice and to sit down and maybe establish a relationship with a physician or with a therapist to talk through their experience. Um, I imagine that there are going to be things that are going to be developed for this. This is relatively novel. We've never had an experience like this before where we've endured a, p a pandemic like this. Um, and I think we are going to have to do something for these first responders who are, who are traumatized right now. Um, as far as um, Will they be able to spend time with their dying patients? Um, I'm not sure that that's a question that, that we know the answer to. I think that nurses are spending time with their patients just like any other patient, and they're you know, taking precautions to not become infected, um, and they are spending time with patients as if they would have any other illness as well, um, but they have to do that in a very protected and careful manner. I think it's human nature for healthcare workers and providers of all levels to kind of want to go above and beyond and help their patients no matter what. But I think we also have to take moments and reflect on ourselves and if we're doing more harm than good for both ourselves and our patients. I think we sometimes push ourselves physically and mentally and emotionally as healthcare providers. And I would encourage nurses, doctors, whomever, like Dr. McCarthy is saying, to reach out for help because if you're physically ill or have any symptoms, you pushing through isn't going to help anyone in the long run it's gonna exhaust you and probably spread the disease more. So I think it's okay to take breaks. I don't think it's a sign of failure. I think it's a sign of heroism to take a break and admit that you might need to talk to someone or you might need a day off or you might need that mental health respite. And there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of need um, in various hospitals. Um, I know a lot of uh, people that we graduated medical school with um, that were family medicine or pediatricians um, and that's what they're practicing. Now they're getting pulled in the front line because there is such a need. And you know, the people that were that are ICU or internal medicine doctors that are you know right in that front line every day with patients. At some point, they also have to take a break. So I think that's where people in the medical community are really stepping up to the plate. Um, so it is okay to ask for help um, when you need it. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this question is, I feel like I get super anxious after watching the news. I don't want to not be informed, but I also don't uh, want to get so worked up. What do I do? I feel super anxious <clears throat> after watching the news too. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, you know, we wanna be, we wanna be informed um, and 
it's an amazing era that we live in where we're getting information all the time. Um, I can't stop myself from watching the news sometimes, and I recognize you know, my, my blood pressure going up and my heart rate going up, and I think it's so important to pace yourself with the news um, and to kind of define for yourself, like how, are, how often are you going to check in? Um, so I think that this is a time in which we all need to be vigilant and staying informed, but we also have to be really practical. We can't be informed at every moment. It's detrimental, it's detrimental um, for our work, it's detrimental for our kids to stay informed like that, um, and it's definitely detrimental to be able to feel some sort of ease when, and to rest throughout your day. So I just encourage you, if you're feeling really anxious every time you watch the news, to, to limit how much you're watching the news, um, to pay, pace yourself. Yeah, I mean, I grew up outside New York City uh, during September 11th, so for me, it became hours and days of watching the news as a kid, and it was pretty traumatizing, and it became like almost watching a train wreck over and over, and you couldn't look away, you couldn't stop. And I think with this pandemic and with this worldwide trauma, I think we all have to recognize the importance of being informed, but also recognizing the importance of not falling victim of watching it over and over and over because it could just become like a nonstop, almost like an obsession, I would say, where you feel like you have to stay up to date on everything. And the news is changing, the facts are changing, statistics are changing. So I think you should absolutely find an appropriate amount of time each day, certain breaks in the day to watch the news, but then I would really separate myself and get back to living in the here and now and the things I can control. Thank you. Um, this question is about working from home. My partner and I are both working from home. We're doing well working around each other, but what do we? What do you recommend uh, to us to ensure that we don't get in each other's nerves, on each other's nerves? So, so I, I was reading about some of this too, and about other people's ideas about what to do um, when you're kind of living in a confined space when you weren't used to doing that. And one of the recommendations that I had read was that, you know, defining a space in the room that's kind of like a, a or a, a place in the apartment or the home that's kind of a safe space where, you know, you can kind of go off on your own to spend some time alone. I think it's unnatural to be with somebody 100% of the time, um, and especially if you're not used to doing that. So making sure that you're still able to get some alone time and some privacy and to talk through that, to have open communication about how to give each other some space and some time. Yeah, I, I think if this is becoming your new normal, at least temporarily, I think it's okay to continue some of your schedules that maybe you were before COVID-19. So if you worked out in the morning and your partner worked out at night, I don't think you necessarily have to work out together too or eat every meal together. I think it's okay to kind of keep your own schedules and find the time to be together that are comfortable for both of you. I mean, you put it, two people in a room all day long, no matter if they're married, siblings, mother, father, they're gonna get in each other's nerves as part of human nature too. So I think it's okay to keep your old schedules in some capacities and work with each other. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this person um, is asking, hold on, I lost it here. I'm new to meditation, but I understand its benefits. How should I get started? Is anybody here much in meditation? I think all of us use meditation to a degree. Uh, I got started using meditation using an app on my, my phone, actually. It kind of guides you through 15, 20 minute meditations. Um, there are a lot of different apps for the phone. Mine is Headspace, and I think that it, it actually teaches you how to meditate um, and talks you through these kind of short intervals of meditating. I think it can be really useful. Um, I think using meditation in a physical capacity too, like yoga, can be a good way to start uh, meditating. You meditate, don't you? I do, and I would suggest you start like very, you set your expectations very low. If you think you're gonna sit there for an hour, Good luck. It's, it's a process. It's your first goal of meditation is like two minutes, the first week, then five minutes. I mean, if you think you're going to sit there the whole day and have a moment with God, uh, Father, I don't think that's going to happen through meditation the first week. Yeah, you think got to be a little bit more patient on that. Yeah. So start slow. Make your goals accomplishable. Great. I keep, I keep shutting the microphone off. Um, a friend. Uh, has confided in me that they're feeling depressed 
and anxious. What should I do? I don't want to be dismissive, but I'm also not an expert. That's a great question. Um, and oftentimes somebody who is feeling depressed and anxious doesn't know what to do um, and will often talk to somebody that they care about before they would seek any kind of professional support. Most of the time, I think people are looking for some sort of acknowledgement, some sort of um, experience in which they feel heard. They want to share this with somebody else and have comfort that they're not alone in this. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that can be done easily by a friend or a family member to tell somebody, I absolutely hear you um, and I appreciate what you're going through and I'm here for you and I'm gonna sit with you through this and I'm gonna listen to you through this. Um, and if you find that you need more than this, let's talk about how you might get more than this and how can I help lead you in a direction where you could have professional support. But most of the time I think people are just wanting to be heard and wanting to be validated in their feelings and wanting someone to be present with them when they're feeling distressed. Not everybody who's feeling depressed and anxious needs professional support. I think it's also important to check in on those who are your strongest friends, family, um, the ones that don't really always speak up and say, hey, I am depressed, I am anxious. Um, a lot of times those are the ones you kind of need to be a little worried about and real, not maybe not worried about, but actually have a handout and you know show that support because I think those are the ones that really take things to a different level sometimes that hey you know I can fight through this I, I, you know continue to go to work and just almost pretend and like Dr. McCarthy had touched on earlier almost in that denial phase throughout and you know th that comes with its toll so I think it's important to not only touch on those friends who are uh, anxious and depressed and are vocal about it but also the ones that are rather silent about it too. I guess for me, the way I interpret that question is what are some signs of severe depression, I would say. So for me, for us, I think based on our training and education in our field is, you know, a motivation. So not having interest in things they used to really care for, no energy, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, guilt, um, not sleeping, not eating significant weight loss or weight gain or staying up all night. And I think those are when you need to, you know, go above just having a friend or a parent there to talk to. I think that's when you should call one of the numbers here and ask for some direction because I think we're all feeling the feelings that Dr. McCarthy had expressed, some degree of anxiety, depression, fear, but it's when it's taken to another level and it interferes with our own wellness. It, it kind of, we start deteriorating when we see that in someone else. I think that's when we have to call the number and kind of see, get some more guidance and suggestions. I'd like to say one more thing too. Sometimes um, it's people feel that they should not ask somebody safety questions. That if you ask someone if they're unsafe, that that will somehow be offensive or that it might put something in somebody's head. And, and really the literature and statistically speaking, it's the opposite. Um, people will absolutely tell you, uh, for the most part, if they're feeling unsafe. And so it's really important as a friend to ask somebody, you know, I know you're, you're feeling down. Do you ever get to the point where you think that you're not going to be safe anymore? Do you ever think that your life is not worth living anymore? These are really important questions to ask someone who's volunteering that they're depressed because this may be a different sign that they need um, to be in the hospital or that they need to see a psychiatrist. Um, and people will tell me sometimes, you know, nobody ever asked me this. Nobody ever asked me if I felt unsafe and I've been feeling this way for a long time. I don't know why nobody ever asked me this. So please, if you're wondering if your friend um, is unsafe, go ahead and ask them because I think it can actually do quite a lot of good. Uh, we're going to go to Facebook here. Um, how do I get someone to come out of their room? This person, 17-year-old, doesn't want to get out of their room no matter what. I think that is a good question for the child and adolescent psychiatrist. I think thinking out of the box is key. Um, keep in mind a 17-year-old on the verge of 18, basically an adult, we can't do things like and we can, but I'm sure they wouldn't be very keen on doing it. But like arts and crafts projects and, um, you know, watching cartoons and things like that. I mean, try to think about what they once enjoyed doing, whether it was a couple of years back, pre-corona or whatever. Um, 
even if it starts off as something as simple as like, hey, you wanna play video games in your room, but how about we play video games together? I know it's not ideal, but at least it's doing something together and getting them out of the room. Um, you know, outside activities as we had kind of all touched on, key, I mean, whether it's in the backyard or if there's a basketball hoop, anything to kind of get them out of their room, out of the house, um, I think would be great. I think a lot of factors to that question too. So are they not coming out? Do they have food in their room? Are they eating in their room? Or are they just stuck in their room and not coming out, locking themselves in, not eating, not toileting, not showering, their hygiene's poor, they're feeling hopeless? Or do they have an Xbox, a PlayStation, a cooler, and a mini fridge and snacks all day every day and food's brought up to their bedroom door? You know, I think Dr. Sinner brought up a great point that if they are doing something that they enjoy, like video games, I would say let's bring a video game system out of the bedroom together. Let's bring it out, let's bring it downstairs, we can play X amount of hours a day. And like we had spoken about before, I think it's important to keep a schedule or routine. So if that wasn't their normal before, all of COVID-19, I think we need to reassess what's really going on. It could be a deeper meaning, or it could just be that they have all the things they need in their room and they don't want to leave. And I think it's a kind of a multi-level question. Um, a question here about the other side of the spectrum. Do you know if mental health resources are being provided to nursing homes residents during this time? I guess I couldn't speak for all the nursing homes um, in the area, but I know the LECOM Health System has many um, nursing facilities, and we have a psychiatrist who rotates through these nursing homes and will go in and see people and talk with people. We also have therapists who will go into nursing homes and talk with people. Um, I think that for some folks too, it may be difficult to get out of the nursing home to go and see someone, but most providers are providing a degree of telephonic support or video conferencing, and that could be offered to somebody in a nursing home as well. So if there isn't a particular provider who's working with a nursing home, that individual could reach out for help and, and they could then receive services from an outpatient clinic and um, that they could do that over the telephone or on video. Just a, a random thing I saw on Facebook talking about nursing homes and I thought it would be a cute idea from a child perspective. There are a lot of or parents that are making or asking their kids to draw cards for nursing home residents because they can't have any family visit. So if you're stuck with ideas of what to do with your kid, if they're not, you know, obviously they're not in school and you need some arts and crafts projects, I think it'd be a wonderful idea to make cards to everyone in hospitals or in nursing homes because we, we really can't have visitors in the hospital either. So there are kids on the inpatient unit that don't get visitors either. And yeah, it's wonderful to have a phone call with mom or dad or even to have a FaceTime for a little bit. But I think making cards for the people who are kind of in these situations goes above and beyond and is a great project and is, I think is rewarding for your child but also rewarding to the people in the nursing home. Thank you. Another question uh, from Facebook. I have been having a terrible time sleeping during this. What should I do? You are not alone. Um, lots of people are having a terrible time sleeping through this and I, I think that's one of the um, classic symptoms of anxiety, laying in bed and uh, ruminating and ruminating and um, worrying about all of these things that aren't in our control right now and it can really disrupt sleep. Um, so we talk a lot as a group about sleep hygiene um, and certainly during a pandemic and having to be indoors and to social distance, it really disrupts routine. So. Um, all of those things that maybe were being done before, like getting up early in the morning and having a full day's worth of work and um, eating meals separated throughout the day might have changed. And so if your pattern is really different now and you're spending a lot more time being sedentary and you're not as physically active and you're having uh, a much different kind of routine, that could really disrupt sleep. So, so number one, I would check in with your sleep hygiene. Um, can you do something throughout the day to get back on a regular routine and a regular schedule that will make you more sleepy at night? Um, second thing is watch your caffeine intake. If you're drinking lots of coffee now because you can make a pot or make three pots um, at home, that could really disrupt your sleep. Um, if you're using any other substances um, that might be stimulating, uh, you know, alcohol as well, 
Alcohol can be great to help people fall asleep, but it ultimately is really disruptive for sleep. Uh, people wake in the middle of the night after having some drinks and they can't fall back to sleep, and so sleep can be really disruptive. So I would watch alcohol consumption too. Um, I would try and get into a regular bedtime routine, set a time on going to bed and then really stick with that, try and limit um, phone use or uh, television right before bed or you know using an iPad um, because a lot of activity can also disrupt sleep. I think ultimately if you try all of these things and you're not able to sleep, um, there are certainly medicine that can be helpful to get people to fall asleep as well, um, but that would be something that you would need to talk to a professional about and, and seek out some advice from a physician. A lot of adults, whether they're my parents' age or older, um, rely on the news 24-7. And as we talked about the great points of the media and the news, kind of focusing on the statistics and how this virus is progressing, all positives. But I think a lot of people are so hyper-focused on watching the news morning, like they wake up and right as they go to bed. And then, you know, just like watching a horror movie, you know, some news, there's some negative statistics that come out and that just almost kind of resonates in your mind and then prevents you to, you know, not sleep even further. So it really is like a cycling effect. What I, what I personally always try to encourage my patients to do is not have any electronics in the bedroom. I know it's so hard to do, but in reality, if you use your bedroom just for sleep, you're gonna condition your brain that when you get into your bedroom, it's bedtime and it's gonna be easier for, to fall asleep. So with a lot of people working from home, it might be super comfortable to just roll over, pick up your laptop and do work from your bed. But then you're teaching your brain that this is where you do activity as well. And this is where you have to do a lot of thinking and thought processing. But if you get up and move to, let's say your kitchen or another room in the house and use your bed solely for sleeping, every time you hit the pillow, you're gonna condition your brain that this is a place just for sleep and it's gonna provide some kind of respite for your brain too. Um, so we encourage even kids, no video games in the bedroom at all, no iPad, cell phones get turned in and turned off at nine o'clock or depending on their age. Uh, so yeah, like Dr. McCarthy and Dr. Sina said, I think it's all about creating that environment and creating a, a mental preparedness for falling asleep. Okay, uh, back uh, to Facebook here. Are there any resources, mental health resources available to folks who lost their jobs and no longer have insurance? Um, so, I don't know that I fully understand that question. Um, so, as, somebody basically, are there mental health uh, resources for somebody with no... Um, with no, I see, I understand better now, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I mean, I think that depending upon somebody's ability to come in for treatment, um, there are self-pay options, um, and there are a number of community mental health centers who will see people for free. If somebody has a serious mental illness, um, Erie County will fund somebody, it's called base funding, but if they're eligible for base funding, um, they can be seen for free. So it really depends upon where somebody would wanna be seen, what they might be willing to do, but there's lots of options. Um, Erie County is really, really wonderful and rich with resources, and I wouldn't want somebody's lack of ability to pay for the treatment to keep them away from treatment because there's lots and lots of options for people to get help and support even if they don't have insurance or, or even if they don't have um, the, the means to pay for it. Thank you. Uh, this person is asking about when they are, uh, go to the store, how do they politely tell people to keep their distance? <laughs> That's all you. I feel like I'm really good at this because um, I've been asking people to keep their dis distance from me for quite a long time. Um, but you know, I, I think um, that it's difficult sometimes when you feel really, really strongly about something and somebody feels differently or is not maybe feeling as anxious as you are about what to do. Um, but I think there's all kinds of ways to, to talk to somebody about your experience. And, and you might say, you know, I'm feeling really, really nervous about this and I'd really like you to be able to keep your distance from me. Um, you know, it can be framed as well that, you know, I may have come in contact with this and I don't wanna get you sick. So if you could maybe 
keep your distance from me so that I don't infect you, um, which in actuality is the truth. Um, any one of us could be a carrier, and not only are we protecting ourselves, but we're, we're protecting one another. This social distancing is more about, you know, the global impact and not necessarily one person being, being protected. And so far, I mean, in a lot of grocery stores, whether it's Wegmans, Giant Eagle, I've been seeing them really take great action as far as this whole six feet apart. Maybe it's not quite six feet, but they are doing a great job to take their own precautions as far as sanitizing, um, you know, uh, uh, what are they? The carts, the shopping carts, the belts, um, and really anything that people touch. So I think different companies are really taking a huge stand on this social distancing and preventing the virus. I was just going to say, I feel like as a community, people have become much more understanding and sensitive and aware. And I think like Dr. McCarthy said, you can just say, hey, I'm just going to practice social distance, distancing. Do you mind stepping back a bit? I've had to say it before. I'm not one to like confrontation. And they apologize. They just say, oh, I'm, I totally forgot about it. So I, I think there's a lot of understanding nowadays and maybe just having to remind each other. Dr. McCarthy reminds me of it every day because I still am not wonderful at it, but I'm practicing. <laughs> okay, um, I don't have any more questions, uh, so last words, and where can people find you? Absolutely. Um, we're just so grateful that you would join us this evening. You know, we want you all to know that we are with you in this and that we are available, um, that we've never really experienced anything like this as a community, um, and we're, we're grateful for you tuning in tonight if you were able to do so. Um, if you have any questions for us or if you have anything that you're not sure about, you can reach out. Um, again, on our, on our slide up here, we have some phone numbers. We have an outpatient facility that you can call and we have case managers there who can help direct your questions. So if, even if you're not certain that you wanna see a psychiatrist but you just have some questions, you could talk with somebody directly and they can help guide you. Um, if you're really, really struggling and you feel that you need to be seen urgently, you can always walk into the emergency room at Mill Creek Community Hospital, which is the other number up here. Um, but we want you to know that you are not alone um, and that we're in this with you. I, I just want to say thank you to everyone in our community for practicing social distancing, for helping out those who need the help, and thank you to all the healthcare workers and everyone else involved in treating our families and loved ones and helping this pandemic become less influential and impactful than it could have been. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say thank you for practicing social distancing, something that I think has become almost uh, viral on the internet and social media, but really I think just simple things as far as six feet apart and hand washing and really being mindful of let's not have more than about five people in a room um, are really key things that you're doing to help prevent this virus. And I really think you're all doing a big part in all of this. Thank you. And finally, last word, I want to thank Ferky Ferrati and the Jefferson Educational Society. We truly, over these last three sessions, have enjoyed this partnership with you and we hope PLECOM and the Jefferson Educational Society can continue this partnership down the road. I'd like to thank our good friends from PCN for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank my colleagues for giving up their time and sharing their wonderful insights with you, our audience, tonight. Our purpose at LECOM Health is to help you. So please, don't hesitate to give us a call. Megan referenced the numbers on the screen. Visit us on the web. We have telemarketing available to you. We're stopping into the hospital and we can help you. Our job through this pandemic is to help you find the silver lining within it. So thank you for the gift of your time tonight and good night.